So this morning we are going to try to help you discover who Jesus is, decide in your mind that you need him as Savior and Lord. And for those of you who have done that, we're going to try to help you learn to defend what you have been taught and what you have in your heart. Brother Michael Farley is going to come first and share with us uh, proving that Jesus is God's son. Come on, Michael. I'm as nervous as a cat around water. Um, I had night one of the adult Bible study, and um, I've got 10 minutes to go through this, and if you were in there that night, I think we went for an hour and 45. Um, but night one's title was, Is Jesus Really God's Son? And um, I, I want to start with a question. Why do you believe what you believe? All right, that's, I think that's a good question to start with. For anybody, why do you believe what you believe? And I'm going to get down to the foundational basis of school. All right, Jacob, put that first picture up there. Who is this? Anybody want to yell it out? Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea. Is there any photographic evidence? John, don't answer. Is there any photographic evidence that that's Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea? Absolutely not. All we have is drawings and paintings. All right, do the next one. Who's that? Ben Franklin. Same thing. We don't have any photographic evidence of who this man is other than what we've seen in books and so forth. And then the last one's easiest. George Washington. Why do we believe who these men are? Because it's what we've been indoctrinated, and I'll use the word indoctrinate, through elementary school, middle school, high school, college, TV shows, whatnot. We've been taught our whole lives that those men represent who they are in those pictures, and we don't question that. But if you were to put a picture of Jesus Christ up there, everybody say, well, that's Jesus Christ. Well, how do you know? Because that's what the painting or the picture shows. But if you go out in the outside world, people are going to question, I don't know if Jesus really exists. You're going to have atheists question you on those sort of things. But they don't question who George Washington is. So why is it different for us? Is that the next question there, Jacob? All right, and that gets into the idea of absolute truth, and that's what I started with Monday night, absolute truth, which is an unalterable and permanent fact. But according to some statistics I found, you're going to have people who are going to sit there and argue with you. You're going to have people sit there and argue with you today that a square has round sides and that a circle has square sides. That, that's just the way our society is. That there is not a whole lot of people today that believe in an absolute truth, and I believe according to what Mitch has said and what the Bible says, because it's the infallible word of God, that the Bible is an absolute truth. So what's in the Bible is a truth that is not questioned. And that's where we'll get with the study here in a minute, because I'm going to read some, a couple of statistics to you real quick. This is Barna Research. January 2000, 38% of adults in America believe that absolute truths exist. Less than a year later, that number dropped down to 22%. November of 2001, it went from 38% in January of 2000 to 22% in November of 2001. Here's some statistics for age groups. If you were born in 1965 or later, that's me, 13% of us believe in absolute truths. 24% of people born in 1945 or before believe in absolute truths. Pretty big jump there between age groups. 32% of those who attend conservative Christian churches believe in absolute truths, and 32% of adults who call themselves born-again Christians believe in absolute truths. So that's saying that the majority of born-again Christians and the majority of conservative Christian churches in America don't believe in absolute truths. So if I took 10 people as a sample population, only three out of those 10, according to this research, is going to believe in an absolute truth. That's a pretty staggering statistic if you look at our society and what we believe. But the reason I tell you that is because this lesson, I told him was straight, plain Jane, fact of the matter. It's whether you choose to accept it or not. And that's the way the gospel is. But it starts in Matthew, is where the, um, and I'm not going to read the verses. Um, but Matthew chapter 3 tells the story of John the Baptist. And then we also go into John chapter 1, continuing on with the story of John the Baptist. Go ahead, I'll, I'll read them real quick, Jacob, because they're, they're on there. 
All right, it says, Then Jesus went to Galilee, to the Jordan River, to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. He says, I am the one who needs to be baptized first. And Jesus says, why are you come? And he says, why are you coming to me? Is what John the Baptist says. Jesus said, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So God's, Jesus is replying to John the Baptist saying, it is a requirement of me to be baptized. So John agrees to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were open. He saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settled on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And then we go into John. It says, the next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he acknowledged who Jesus was as he walks by. He is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is one who will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I can testify that he is the chosen one of God. Amen. The following day, John was again standing with the two of, his, two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. Now this story appears in all four Gospels, in different wording, of course. But what we had to do, and if you want to take a piece of paper out and write this down, because there's a bunch of verses that go with this, I had the classes break up into groups, three witness groups, all right? And we're going to go through this real quick, just like those witness groups did. And we did this as an agency D3. We are collecting evidence on, is Jesus Christ really God's son? And that was where we started out. And then by the end of the night, we had to prove that Jesus was really God's son. So witness report one came from the Old Testament prophets. And there's a lot of stuff up there. And you don't have to write all that down. You can just get the verses down. But first of all, you see Rachel weeping. And Rachel has promised that there's going to be a new covenant given. All right? Um, and that forgiveness of wickedness is going to take place with that new covenant. Then, and that's in Jeremiah, and then the second point there is you get the promise of a new land, a new heart, and a new spirit, a new Holy Spirit. And with that new Holy Spirit, you're going to have the removal of a stony heart. And I think those of us in it, that are in here that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior are going to say, yeah, I used to go through life and I didn't care about other people. I didn't have a soft heart to serve the Lord in this capacity or that capacity. I just went through my life worrying about myself, me and I. But now that I'm a Christian, God's removed that stony heart from me, and I've got compassion. I hear, I hear people that are in need, or I see people broke down on the side of the road, and my heart's pricked to go help them out and serve them. And that's what they're talking about there in Ezekiel chapter 36. Number three, you are my son, I have begotten you. That comes from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, which is a song, if you do some extra research about it, that was sung when Israel appointed a new king. So Psalm chapter 2 is actually foretelling of Jesus after he's baptized being anointed as the king of all kings. And then number four, he is the elected one. He is going to bring justice for the Gentiles out of Isaiah 42. And then again in Isaiah 53, it says that he is, he's going to be wounded and bruised. And I put after that sacrifice. That is foretelling of the sacrificial lamb that he is going to represent for us as human beings so that we can accept him as our Lord and Savior. And what we call in plain Jane terms is be saved. All right. So that's witness report one. That's all the prophet stories telling of Jesus Christ coming. All right. Witness report two is from Jesus himself. Matthew chapter three says, I've come to be baptized. Number two, he said baptism must be done in order to fill God's requirements. So he's being obedient to God's will. Now, I'm not getting into the Holy Trinity and all that, but that's what this is going to deal with some here. And then number three, John the Baptist, the next day, as it says, I saw Jesus walking by. John the Baptist there acknowledges that Jesus was being pre the preeminence and authority that Jesus Christ held now that he was baptized, and he saw the Holy Spirit come sit down on him like a dove. Amen. Witness report three is going to be the crowd that followed John the Baptist. 
So you've got confession of sins by this crowd because John the Baptist as a little boy, his father, Zechariah, was a priest. And Zechariah, when he was born, said that my son's going to foretell, the story, or foretell of a Savior coming. And that's what John the Baptist does. John the Baptist goes out and lives in the wilderness and uh, wearing animal hides and fur, eating honey and locusts, telling people they need to repent of their sins because Israel had fallen into that cycle again of being sinful. And so people were coming to him in their sinful nature, wanting to repent and be baptized. And so that's what John the Baptist was doing. And then again, the, the, the crowd around saw the heavens open up, the dove descend down on Jesus, lighting on his shoulder as the Holy Spirit. And they see all that happening. And then at that same time, they hear the voice of heaven say, this is my son in whom I am well, whom I love and I am well pleased. Putting the Holy Trinity together. Now, that's the witness reports that we had. And I know I, I, I ran through that fast. And, and I hope you got those verses down as I went through that. But the moral of the story is this. In that story, Jesus Christ is baptized. Jesus Christ being baptized in the Jordan River has no, that, that Jordan River water has no significance. And I know Mitch just probably put a cap of water up, upstairs today from when he went to the Jordan River. And I actually went and got that bottle uh, Monday night. But there's nothing special about that Jordan River water because millions upon millions of gallons flow through that river every month. Jesus' baptism as an act is what's of importance. It is of the utmost importance that Jesus Christ is baptized because, one, it reveals him as God's son, and two, Jesus accepts his Father's plan for him. And he accepts that plan to be a sacrificial lamb knowing what the end result is when he could have been disobedient just as we are to our parents and, and older people many times. But he accepted that so that you and I would have that free gift of eternal life if we so choose to accept that as our gift. So you have the evidence. You've got the prophets foretelling it. You've got Jesus' firsthand account. You've got the crowd that followed that saw it. And you've, you've heard the words, the choice, like I told the class that night, it's just like anything else in life. You have to choose whether you accept that or not. Day two, we spoke of um, Jesus. Is he more than just a good man? And I'll be trying to present to you day two. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, that was our memory verse, and it says for us to sanctify the Lord in our heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you for the reason of the hope that you have with meekness and with fear. We are to love the Lord and we are to honor Him and we are to set Him apart in our hearts. And my, my thought here is, can Jesus do miracles? Is Jesus more than just a good man? And that was the thought of the, the second day's lesson. And I want to read you six verses of Scripture and then give you just a little overview of Mark chapter 6. We're going to read Mark chapter 6, the first six verses. And this is Jesus going to his hometown. And I want to ask you this question as we present day two. How much do you truly believe in Christ that he is more than a good man, that he can do miracles? And do you allow Christ to do miracles in your life? Starting in verse 1, it says, And when he went up from thence, and he came to his own country, me and his own city, the city of Nazareth, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished. Why were they astonished? They knew Jesus as a boy. It's fixing to say these things. They were his neighbors. They were his friends. They were astonished at the words of this man, saying, From thence has this man these things, and what wisdom is this which is given to him, that ever such mighty works may be wrought by his hands? Is this not just the carpenter, the son of Mary, and then they go to list in his family. Isn't he the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and of Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were even offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country. 
and among his own kin, meaning his own people, and of his own house, meaning his own family. And, and look what it says. And there he could do not many works or many mighty works, save he laid his hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the villages teaching. Why could Jesus not do miracles in Nazareth? Because of the people's disbelief. Now listen, that doesn't limit. He could have done miracles, but he didn't because of their lack of faith. But if you turn right into Mark chapter 6, study the rest of that chapter. Jesus sends out his disciples. Then as he's out preaching on the side of a hillside, he takes five little loaves and two little fish, and he breaks them into pieces. It says that he, he took it, and he broke it, and he gave it after he had blessed it, and God multiplied it, and he fed 5,000 men, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. Then it says he picked up 12 baskets of fragments. Why could Jesus do this? It was because there was believing hearts. And guys, I want to tell you, when you need a miracle from God, I believe a lot of the miracle comes from the belief that is in our heart. Jesus sent his disciples out in Mark chapter 6 again uh, to cross the Sea of Galilee, and it says he went up on a hill to pray, and he could still see them out there in the boat and a storm comes up and Jesus walks on the water out to those men he could do miracles because there was belief he could do miracles because he was the son of God and then it tells us that Jesus went into other cities and I really want you to see what it says it says he healed all who touched him and it's so important, when Jesus would go into these cities, they had heard the stories of the power of God. They had heard the might of Almighty God. And it said they laid their sick in the streets. It didn't matter what it took. They said, all we got to do is get to Jesus. They laid those folks. They brought them out from everywhere to get them to Jesus. If nothing else, it says there in the end of Mark chapter 6, if they could just touch the fringe of his garment. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I would be made whole and it says all who touched him were healed so Jesus miracles and his teaching prove that Jesus was more than just a good man but like Michael said you've got to decide for yourself and I believe church as individual believers in Christ I believe we limit Christ because of our lack of faith in him he says that through his people, greater works than these will be done. And I believe we limit him. And we need to be people who believe in his power because he is more than a good man. He is the son of the living God, the savior of the world. Brother John, come and share these last days with us. Amen. I've been commissioned with... Uh... Uh, the last couple of days in uh, our VBS study that dealt with uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then what do you do with these proofs? Uh, the questions were, was Jesus' death real? Is Jesus alive? And what do I do with this evidence? We're going to start with um, the, the first one that, that stands all on its own. And is, was Jesus' death Real and, and during our VBS study, it took us through uh, Mark chapter 14 and also chapter 15, which deal uh, exclusively with the uh, crucifixion of Jesus Christ and, the, and the, the things leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. You see, why is this important? You need to ask yourself real quickly, why is this important? Because, see, it's easy to glance this off and say, all right, there are infallible proofs that Jesus was really a man who really lived on this earth. Uh, there's no denying it. Even, even your, your highest skeptics will say that Jesus was a real person. We have Roman documentation of Jesus. We have extra biblical um, documentation from people like Josephus and, and, uh, and several others that would attest that Jesus was a real person. Even, even your skeptics will say, even people from other religions such as uh, Islam and, and Judaism will say that uh, Jesus was an actual person. There's no denying the personhood of Jesus Christ, uh, biblically or extra-biblically. But where we have to determine is, is was Jesus' death real? And we can glance this over and we say, well, if he was a real person, the natural progression of things is death. I mean, the statistic is one out of one. 
One out of one of us will die apart from uh, the, the rapture of the church. You see, to first discover or to understand um, the resurrection, we have to understand the death of Christ. The death of Christ is necessary to fully grasp the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, it was in the death of Christ that he shed his blood. It was Isaiah 53, which uh, Michael uh, mentioned earlier, that would give us a description of, of the scourging and the punishment that Jesus would undergo leading up to his crucifixion. It would be Isaiah who some 650 to 700 years before the very birth of Christ would say things like he would die among thieves or among the wicked. And he would say that he would, he would be buried among the rich. And it would be later that we would find Jesus hanging on a cross among two thieves, death with the wicked. It would be after the death of Jesus Christ that he, we would see him buried in a borrowed tomb of a wealthy man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Amen. You see, it would be these things that we would understand that, yes, God had a plan from the very beginning, and the plan included death. The unfortunate side of this is that his disciples didn't fully understand this plan, even though Jesus tried telling them over and over again. He tried to tell them, I'm going to die, but three days later, I'm going to raise again. I'm going to be resurrected. You see, to fully understand the resurrection, we have to grasp the death of Jesus Christ. You say, but Jesus died on a cross. He was crucified. You're 100% right. But do you realize that thousands among thousands of other people died upon crosses? I mean, even in the narrative in the Gospels, we see Jesus placed between two others. So the, the, the cross itself doesn't set Jesus apart. You see, it... it Thousands of people, the crucifixion was used as, as, as a Roman form of capital punishment. Many people were crucified. And crucifixion was an ugly way to die. I don't mean to get too graphic, but, but can you picture the fact of, and then just to put it in, 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 in terms, crucifixion was death by asphyxiation. It means you couldn't breathe. You couldn't get the right amount of oxygen. Crucifixion was a death that where they would hammer nails in the hands of the, of the person being put to death. They would put a nail in their feet. Then they would hang them up. And the pressure of their bodies weighing down on their chest wouldn't allow their diaphragm to pull the right amount of air into their lungs. So how did they breathe? They had to push up. So they would push up or they would pull up on these nails. And that would be the process. You see, not only was it death by asphyxiation, but it was a, well, it was public humiliation. The person was helpless, and it would draw out, and it would be long. Sometimes it would take days. And when they needed that cross, they would go by and they would break the legs of the person on the cross so that they couldn't push up anymore to expedite the process. But I don't know that it was the crucifixion that killed Jesus. See, there was a moment on the cross where Jesus took the sins of you and me on himself, the man who lived a perfect, sinless life would absorb the sins of the entire world on himself. And for a moment, the Trinity would be separated as he looked to God and he couldn't see the Father anymore. And he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Bible tells us that after the death of Christ, that there would be a, 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 a spear that would be run through his side. And it says the blood and water flowed out of, out of that. And I've heard the speculation. I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor. I don't have any kind of medical degree. I mean, the best that I've got for you is, is some first aid training, all right? But from what I understand, there's a sack of fluid that encapsulates the heart. 
And apparently that sack had been ruptured at some point. I wonder, and I know we're, we're, we're mingling the physical with the, the spiritual, but I wonder if Jesus didn't die of a broken heart. Because of my sin. Because of your sin. You see, you have to understand the death of Jesus to get to the crucifixion, to get to the resurrection. You see, we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the, in the Greek, the term gospel means good news, and you've heard that. But I'm here to tell you that it is the resurrection that makes the gospel good. Amen. Amen. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us hope. We get to the resurrection. You see, without the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul would, would give us a, a description in Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. You got that scripture for me? 1 Corinthians 15. That's 1 Corinthians 12, verse 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. I'll read it. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead... How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Hear what Paul is teaching us here. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Did you hear that? If Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ then we of all men are most pitiable. You see, it is not apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even Paul says that is the, the cornerstone. That is the basis of our faith. That is what gives us hope. That is what makes the gospel good news. And you say, John, what about the proofs of the resurrection? I've heard so many things, and, and we can go on and on about so many things. Let me give you a couple of things that, that I hope encourage you uh, in, in your heart. There are, are many proofs, and I, I can't get into all of them. I love apologetics. I love this stuff. This is this is my bread and butter this is what I teach predominantly I love this stuff you see there were two women who were last at the crucifixion but they were first at the tomb you see you got the account of the two women coming to the tomb you see if we if, if the early Christian fathers wanted to make up a resurrection then they wouldn't have made up a story of two women at the tomb. Let me tell you why. Ladies, uh, I promise you, I think this is, this, is, this is one of God's ways of showing that he is anything but chauvinistic. Christianity has looked at being chauvinistic in so many ways. Uh, he allowed to, you see, in the day that Christ died, the witnesses of women held absolutely no value. In the day that Jesus died, Women couldn't even, in a court of law, be held as witnesses. Do you get that? As a matter of fact, there's this story of an ancient Jewish prayer that included the line, Thank you, God, that I am not a woman. You see, they were a very patriarchal society. They depended solely on men. So let me get this straight. Reason with me here. Discover, decide, defend. Reason with me here for just a moment. If I'm going to make up a story and I want to substantiate it with witnesses, I'm going to use some men with influence from my society to be the first ones to recognize the empty tomb. You see, it profited the disciples absolutely nothing. But you see, the disciples had nothing to prove. Jesus was alive. Then there is the swoon theory that said that Jesus actually didn't die on the cross, but he just passed out. 
he, 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 he swooned, he passed out, and, and, and he was laid in the tomb, and, and a couple of days later, he came to himself and, and rode a, a two-ton rock out of the way. And God, so, so let me get this straight. You, you, you scourged him. And I don't know if you know about Roman scourging, but most of the time, people didn't live past the scourging. The goal of the scourge was to prevent crucifixion. So he was punished enough and left without food and water, dehydrated, and beat to the point where he was almost unrecognizable. Nailed to a cross, passed out. And a couple of days later, he had the strength to roll a 2,000 ton tomb, uh, stone out from in front of his tomb and, and to beat up an entire battalion of Roman guards and escape. Just to be counted just a few short hours later, taking a seven-mile trek to Emmaus with two other guys? I mean, come on. And then you got the story that says that, uh, well, the disciples stole the body. Well, let's reason this again. Did I not tell you there was an entire battalion of trained Roman soldiers stationed at uh, Christ's tomb? Yet a couple of fishermen, a tax collector and a doctor, were able to overwhelm these trained soldiers, roll the tomb out of the way, the stone out of the way from the tomb, and, and, and hide the body of Jesus. You see, the math just isn't there. And then you've got the other idea that somebody else stole the body. Well, here's the problem with that. If somebody else stole the body, once they saw this Christian thing taking uh, uh, a hold, that if the Roman soldiers stole the body or if the high priest stole the body, at some point to, to kill uh, the, the, the whole uh, notion that Jesus was raised from the dead, somebody would have produced a body. You see, there are undeniable proofs and, and, and one of the biggest ones that really get me is have you under, did you understand that when Jesus was captured and scourged, his disciples scattered? I hate to qualify the disciples this way, but they run like cowards. Yet a few short days later, they preach like kamikazes. And, and it wasn't that they immediately went out. And to the rest of the world. No, no, no. They started in the city that should have all of the proof to snuff out the, the, the notion that Jesus was raised from the dead. If anyone would have been able to go to a tomb and say, no, what they're telling you is wrong. Right Here's a body. They wouldn't have started at Jerusalem, the epicenter of, of their preaching. They went back to their hometown. As a matter of fact, Jesus' little brother himself, James, would end up becoming the pastor at the most volatile city among Christians. James would become the pastor at the church at Jerusalem. You see, there are so many undeniable proofs. And then what about the fact that all these disciples, you see this this. Uh, um, um, this Faith, this Christianity taking hold and getting traction and, and going and growing. You ever seen a political figure lose? A lot of people get behind them and, and, and they, they, they push and they support and they campaign and, and they spread and, and they do all that they can, but let that political figure lose. And they'll go find them another leader to get behind. That wasn't the case with the followers of Jesus. You see, even what seemed like a loss became the good news that the gospel is based on. The supporters didn't scatter and find somebody else to support. Instead, they stayed behind Jesus because he hadn't lost. You see, they were able to do what we do today and preach that Jesus is the champion over sin, Satan, and death. Amen. 
He's the champion that we preach. He, he is the victor over death, hell, and the grave. The crucifixion couldn't kill him forever. The grave couldn't hold him in. The nails couldn't hold him down. It, it, it was by the power of God that he was raised from the dead. David prophesied it, Peter professed of it, and we get to praise God for it. Amen. You see, it is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that puts us in the place we're at today. You didn't come here this morning. I hope you didn't come here this morning on a whim just to hear a couple of good stories. And maybe to get patted on the back just a little bit. I hope you come this morning to hear the truth about Jesus Christ and the gospel message that he has to share. You see, because at the end of all of this, we have to make a decision. Michael said at the beginning, was Jesus God's son? Well, you have to decide. Our pastor said it a little bit later. He said, listen, at some point, you have to make a decision. I'm going to tell you finally here today, you have to make a decision. Do you still have the 1 Peter 3.15 up there? The scripture? I want to remind you of this scripture. It says, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. First, you have to always be ready to give an answer for the hope. You gotta have the hope to begin with. You have to make a decision. Is this that we presented to you real? Was Jesus the Son of God? Was Jesus more than just a mere man? Did Jesus really die for your sins? Was he really resurrected from the grave? And what are you gonna do with it? You see, Pilate at Jesus' trial would ask the ultimate question that I would propose to you. He would look at the crowd, and as they're calling for Barabbas, he would say, what am I to do with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? I would present that same question to all of us here today. What are we going to do with Jesus? What are we going to do with him? Josh McDowell would say he was one of three things. He was either a liar, uh, a, a, a con man, who would con all of these people into following him. Or he was a lunatic and he really believed what he said, but there was no actual power in him. Or he really is Lord. Now what is he to you? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? That'll preach. Are you ready to defend the hope that you have? Do you have the hope in the first place? That's the question. I'll we'll ask if you would to bow your heads.